Scott's here today. This is Lauren Baker and Bob Cheeseman. Uh, we'll just go over a, a few experiences that we had and things that we can recollect. And so at any time, like Mr. Lund says, just raise your hand if you have a question, okay? We all started in the first grade at Shazy Central Rural School. Our teacher's name was Miss Robinson. Now that is the same teacher that my father had when he went to school in Shady Sea. We all, well, through the years, and we all graduated together in 1954. Now in the old school, as we always call it, there were these huge hallways. At the ends of the hallways on each floor were these imitation bells that hung there. And there were washrooms, boys and girls washrooms on every floor. We had this beautiful auditorium where when you walked in, there were these six large leather coated doors and they all had these round glasses in them. And all around the doors were all these little brass buttons. All the seats in the auditorium had all these little brass buttons in them. These two uh, canvases up on the walls that one there was at the head of the auditorium. When you come in, that was always displayed. And what that was explained to us at that time was that was the progress of agriculture and the in industry as it improved. On one side, you see a guy with an old hand side. And then I believe in the background, you see a piece of a horse-drawn horse -drawn, uh, combine which was a great improvement at that, at that time, the horses and the mechanical machines. And when we, every time we came into the auditorium, that was right there. This particular one of Samuel D. Champlain greeting the Indians was a, was a huge drop that was on the stage. They, normally that would always hang below when we would come in. And then they'd raise that if we had a program, or we always called it the assembly program. Every Friday, we, there was always scheduled a program. It started right from the first grade right up through to the senior class. They all took their turns. Now, I believe that it's getting back to that now. When we entered the auditorium for a program, we were all ushered in with a flag bearer. It, normally, it was a high school boy and they would come to our rooms, they would greet us at the door, and we would all file in line, single file, we'd come down the hallways, and they would usher us in, stand there as we went into the rows that we were seated. Then they'd all come down and stand one at a time, and it's very similar to where the big flag is now. They would all go over and place their flag in there. It was a real professional way of getting us in. Uh, I don't want to take all the floor here, well, yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to something about the school, and then if you want to get on something else, uh, there were two dining rooms in the school. They were on the fifth floor. The one on the south side of the building was the elementary dining room. Then, then the one on the north was the high school dining room, and we always had dining room monitors. And normally this was a teacher, and at that time we had a truant officer in the school. Anybody know what a truant officer is and does? This was a gentleman, he was about six foot two. He was dressed in a very dark suit and gray hair like some people get as they get older. And he would be in the auditorium like this. And all he had to do, if somebody was getting out of line, he would just look. And discipline was, was 110%. And also the truant officer at that time, let's say Jake Beeman, didn't come to school that day. He was on the phone, and if there wasn't a phone in the house, and a lot of times, and well, this is 55, almost 60 odd years ago, a lot of homes didn't have telephones was very unusual for all homes to have it. During the day, he would go and see, is Jake Beeman home? Is he really sick? 
or as his mother kept him out for some other reason. Normally it didn't happen in the younger classes, it was probably when they got into high school, in junior high, because in the spring of the year and in the fall of the year, a lot of the older boys and sometimes the girls had to stay home to help with the farming. See, we all at one time or other grew up on small farms. And like today in this area, well, if you think of the North Farm, Mr. Rovers has a huge farm. Well, <coughs> if you were to go down Route 9 and say five miles south of Route 9, there were probably at least 10 small farms. I, I think from here to five miles down, uh, the only farm that I can think of at this point is the Grigler Farm in, in, in five miles. And there used to be at least 10 of them in that little area. And, well, we'd all, you know, we were up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We all had chores to do before we went to school, which meant milking the cows and feeding the pigs and chickens. We all had pigs, chickens, cows right in our backyard. We grew up with that. <coughs> if we needed eggs, well, we went out to the chicken coop and we collected the eggs. I can remember a number of times on Saturday afternoon or Sunday we were going to have guests or we were going to have the Sunday dinner. We would go out and literally catch the chickens out of the chicken coop and we would, well, we, I would say kill them, and we'd dress them and we'd prepare them for the meal. Well, today I guess you probably go to Sam's or Walmart or one of these other places. You get your chicken, it all comes wrapped in a nice little frozen plastic bag. Well, we used to go out and chase them around the chicken coop and bring them in the house and mom would cook them. So, I'm gonna, you gentlemen, let's do a little. How much time we got? Oh, you got as much as you want. <laughs> well, I'm gonna start off a little earlier. I started, I was born in 1934 and lived in the country uh, on a small farm. Uh, in 1941, I started school, a country school uh, with no facilities. Eight classes in a row. We're talking about the, the country schools that surrounded the area before this district. I was in the West AC district. Uh, eight grades in the school uh, with one school teacher. Uh, we started with uh, first grade was blackboards on the left hand side, you're facing the front, and then the blackboards went away all the way around the front of the school. And the teacher would start to give us a test. She said, first grade to eighth grade. And you would go as far as grade. If you were in third grade, you would go as far as you could go on that blackboard, answering questions, and you would grade it on that. Uh, most of the time, all tests were, and all your studies were recited out loud from the teacher. There wasn't a lot of people in the class, anywhere from four to six. Uh, the school had a, there was no running water. We had an outside dining house, what they call a back house, that was our bathroom. One for girls and one for the boys. We are running water. We drank from the uh, Excuse me. Come on, we do this. We just lost the sun. Uh, Lee, could you tell about how your teacher got back and forth to school? Okay. This is started in 1941 when I started school. A girl by the name of Geraldine Hughes uh, started, was her first teacher. Her salary was $700 a year. My father was trustee. And he got $25 for money to supply this, for the supplies for the school. That was for the year. And that was also paying a janitor. A janitor, we didn't have custodians. We called them janitors. The hired a child, or a grown up, somebody in seventh or eighth grade to uh, start the fires in the morning, 
They had a big wood stove in the corner, big wood furnace. And we brought in the pail of water. It was a dipper and paper cups. We had a, a white metal kitchen uh, sink in there uh, with no running water in it, but it had a drain that ran to the outside. And all the surplus water went into there. Uh, you wash the tub, if you had to wash your hands after you went to the bathroom, it was full water. And that came out of that water bill also. Uh, the teacher, after she retired, well, she moved on to another, she went to another school. We had a, a lady by the name of Mrs. Frank, Marion French, who was our school teacher. And she came to our uh, school for a new time. They lived on a farm down there. On horseback. <laughs> and this is winter and all. And during some real bad days, she said that my wife's uh, home, which is about a mile away, um, in order to get, so she wasn't caught in the storm with the horse. And the horse had, they had a building at the school for the school that you can have the horse in. We feed that horse at noon time, oats and hay that was brought up by her husband during the week. Uh, I don't know if you passed it. The, uh, the school was located on a very small, about a quarter acre. This, in fact, that land, the school is being lived in now, and it's the same size lot. It's in West Jersey, it's off the Stratton Road. Uh, we walked to school, there was no transportation. I walked a mile and a half to two miles by road. If I went across that through the field, which is in the wintertime, most of the time, because the snow was hard enough to walk on, we used to have hard winters. Uh, you could take and uh, I'd walk in a snow and go to school, which is probably a quarter of a mile shorter. And that, it was on the top of a ridge. You'd fall back. I had a brother went with me. And that was our means of transportation. You know, on uh, very few cars. My dad had a car. And there was times that the road was big. In the wintertime, there was a quick plow. There was so much snow. And they would go probably for a week before we could get out. My father had a horse, and he'd take us to uh, the store or whatever, and take us up, and we'll pick us up at school once in a while with it. If the horse is going to do it, on the snow is hard. They, uh, we didn't have electricity. We had uh, just kerosene lamps. And uh, let's see, what else here? That's where we did our homework. We didn't have, we had wood stoves at home. We cooked in, uh, for the winter months, my people, we buy what they call staples, we buy supplies for the winter. We would buy all their flour and bags, uh, say 25, 30 bags of flour. And they buy lard for cooking sugar. And that was all stored in containers. And my, my dad butchered, like we lived on a farm, uh, he would butcher uh, pigs. Uh, and they'd have salt pork. And in the summertime they'd eat salt and pickles. And these were all kept in broths. And that's, we had, uh, my mom did all the, the bacon, baked her own bread. Cans, we didn't have canned food. We didn't go to the store and buy canned food. It was all preserves that we put up at home. And there was everything, you know, you could raise our own uh, pears, apples, uh, plums, berries. And that's what was through the winter months. And then, 1948, I moved to Shady
That's when you met this group. <laughs> Lucky man. <laughs> <clears throat> I moved on a farm, a good-sized farm. We got up at uh, 4.30 in the morning. Which a big farm, and this is in this five-mile radius, I think, just off and down, Mr. West. Uh, I was just probably two miles from his place. And, I don't know, what, four miles from your place? Yeah, yeah. We get up at 4.30 in the morning, and we did chores, milk. And then we had to get ready. We had our dinner, and our breakfast, and then we went to school. We came home, we got home, we were riding on a bus that long. That was luxury. We had a telephone, we had electricity. And uh, then I came here, and I got to kind of jump a few things, but it's come to me, you know, but uh, we'll get back to it. It's, uh, I met these fellows here, and what was it, seven, three? And uh, we've been friends ever since. Real close friends. We, we came up with somebody else named Mr. Banks. This man is never lost for words once he gets going. <laughs> well, been part of this group since first grade, I guess. Uh, I was born, brought up on a farm. Farmed it all my life. Well, trying to get back to what Lee said. I didn't ever have to go to a, a one-room school. I always went here. But we all, we had our chores to do. And when I was in the fourth grade, a lot of my chores were, well, if I was lucky, I didn't have to get up real early in the morning before school on school day. But for summer months, my job was get home, off that school bus, uh, change clothes, take my pony, and go around up the cows in the pasture and bring them down to the barn. Because in those days, you turn the cows out or today they're kept in the barn for the year round. But bring them down to the barn and they would be milked and then turned out again. And it was, oh, I can just remember just before the milking machines. It was looked at my hand. And then the farmers would get together and one would buy a different piece of machinery and everybody worked together back in those days. You change what we call change time. And you probably get to eat quite a lot of chicken around harvest time. But uh, it, was, <coughs> it was all good. I don't regret a bit of it. But uh, at today's times why everything's done pretty much mechanically. I can remember getting in the gutter and cleaning barns a good many times. Right towards the end of the, my farming career, why well, you touch the button in the barn field to figure that out. Although that stuff is very expensive, but it's very labor saving. And uh, I can remember going to school here, graduating. Just to get back to what Vic said. I think I was in here the other day for class day, and you're getting back to it as far as the ushers are coming in and one thing or another, and it looked good. I guess that pretty near touches it all. Good. You just, uh, when we were in fourth and fifth grade, we used to go up to Gerald's house. Would this be during the spring of the year when? <coughs> syrup and the sap time and your mother always had uh, had us in for uh, syrup on snow colored wax on snow yeah. colored wax on snow we'd yeah. go out in the snow bank with a little tin or whatever and we'd compress the snow into a tin we'd go back in this mother would have the syrup boiling on the stove and they'd pour that on the snow and it was 
It was very delicious. Anybody had that? Yeah, we used to do it back 60 years ago, too. But we'd go out into the snowbank and just get it and push it into the tin. And you had to be careful about giving yellow snow. <laughs> <laughs> that holds true today, too. Mr. Baker. Yes. I got a, some pictures here. I thought I'd pass around while I was talking. I do want them back. This, our fourth grade teacher was Miss Brown. I can only find her in the 1951 yearbook, but if you want to see what our fourth grade teacher, she's a real sweetheart, very good, dedicated teacher. She's right in the center of this bottom picture. And all of you, all of you are in this picture? No, we're not no. in that picture. Oh, okay. uh, and if you want to try to find these ugly old guys, including me that's up here, what we looked like when we were young, and, we were still pretty ugly. Uh, you probably can pick us out of this picture here, because that's our fourth grade class, boys and girls, then the boys and girls separate. You won't find Mr. Ledoux in there because he didn't join us until the next year. Uh, you want patches? Here's another Here's one. Here's another one. copy of the same thing. That, that, that's that was blown up for the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Something no one's touched on yet that I think I'll talk a little bit on is I'll talk about our fourth grade year and what led us into it. We all got out of fourth grade in 1946. That's 54 years ago. Uh, 1946 was right after the end of World War II. It was quite an exciting time because we could do things like we couldn't do before like go to the grocery store and get a candy bar. Because during World War II, sugar was a short in short supply, and so there weren't any candy bars, for instance. You had to have a ration coupon out of a book to get a certain amount of candy from the store. So these were exciting things. People were starting to get new cars again. People were starting to get new farm equipment. And I, too, grew up on a farm. I grew up between this guy and that guy over there, down Route 9. Um, we had 20 cows on our farm. We did all our work with horses in 1946. We had taken over from my granddad. <coughs> my granddad lived with us. as my mom, my dad, me. I'm an only child. And my grandpa. And my grandpa had not modernized through the years before World War II. A lantern in the barn was fine with him. Milking cows by hand was fine with him. He loved horses. He didn't want a tractor. So he worked with horses. So when we took over on the farm in 1942, none of the modern things were available. We didn't have electricity. We had electricity in the house. We had no running water. We had an outhouse, which was really connected to the house, so you didn't have to run outside to do your business, but it was pretty cold out there. Uh, we didn't have a bathroom on Saturday night. We had a big wood stove. We had a big tank on the side called a, re a reservoir. It had warm water in there, and we had a big tin tub. And you would pour the water into the tin tub, and you'd take your bath in the kitchen which is quite different than today. We had uh, no running water in the barn. We'd have to send the cows out of the barn down to the spring twice a day, even in the cold weather, to let them get a drink. Uh, we used kerosene lanterns, lanterns to see in the barn at night. If you can imagine how dangerous that was walking around in the hay mow and so forth with a kerosene lantern. But very few barns burned in those days because of that. Uh, we had no telephone because during World War II you couldn't get a telephone. You had to be someone that really counted like a doctor or something or a policeman to be able to get a telephone if you didn't have one. So as I say, after World War II and when I was in the fourth grade, it was very, very exciting because we were getting all these new and different things that we hadn't had before. 
I also remember fourth grade for something else, something called long division. We did long division for a long time, from the first day of fourth grade to the last day of fourth grade. I was sick several times during the year. First off, I started fourth grade late because I had the measles on Labor Day. So uh, something I guess they give you shots for now and you don't even get measles, from what I understand. Then uh, Miss Brown was so good, she, she would come to the house and bring me my homework, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Then later on in the year, I got the mumps. And Miss Brown would show up dutifully again with my homework, mainly long division. And then later on in the year, I got chicken pox. Again, Miss Brown showed up. Guess what she had with her? More long division. Uh, I guess I'm glad I learned it because later on in life I became an accountant, so I guess I needed that long division. Uh, I think I'll let Mr. Cheeseman go for a little while now. His life, you'll find, was a little different. Well, I started school in Champlain. I went first grade and part of second grade. I came to Shay-Z in, uh, well, the end of April of my second grade. The one thing, first thing I remember was there was a play being given by second grade and uh, I got a chance to watch it in the auditorium, which was really overwhelming to me to walk into for the first time. Uh, we sat up in the balcony, which uh, was in the back, and viewed the play. And I watched uh, all of my future classmates uh, go through their, uh, their paces in that play. And uh, to me, it was a very good play. Um, our principal at the time was Miss Inglis. And uh, she uh, grilled me before she let me enter the second grade in Jay-Z to make sure that I was worthy of being there. And uh, luckily, I answered the questions she asked correctly. Um, time went on, and we got into fourth grade. And one thing uh, that I'm, I know uh, everybody knows or remembers Miss Brown and the one thing I think about Miss Brown is her Mongol pencils. She was quite an artist and she was trying to make us all realize that we had some potential in being artists. So every one of her fourth grade had to have a box of these colored pencils to draw and make pictures, uh, Christmas cards. It uh, was one of the big things I remember. Thanksgiving, we had all made our turkeys and other things that uh, looked pretty nice on paper. Uh, during that fourth grade time, as Mr. Baker said that uh, it was right after World War II, and during World War II, a lot of the things that were transported were by train. And all the trains were pulled by steam engines at the time. I lived in the middle of the village in a house right across from Riley Ford and uh, lived there for two years. I had a chance to watch the trains go by and uh, see all the uh, military vehicles and tanks and whatever they would carry. Uh, I watched uh, with great interest and from that uh, most of my spare time was spent at the railroad station with the uh, ticket agent and uh, I'd watch him as he took uh, his uh, tel uh, telegraph messages and sent them and learned how the signals worked uh, in the station to notify the trains of what to do. He had a, a window he could look, uh, sort of a bay window, he could look up and down the tracks and he had levers to be able to 
raise and lower the signals. And uh, mail time, all the mail was brought in by the train. So there was three or four boys that used to play at the station uh, along with me. And we always had to be there at mail time. Uh, the main trains uh, with the mail would stop. They'd unload freight and the mail bags. But there were the flyers that would come through and uh, they'd kick the mail bag off and the station agent would have to go find it to bring it back for the man that was going to uh, take the mail to the post office. And to get the mail on those flyers uh, w without stopping the train, they had an arm assembly that would uh, just kind of hold the mail bag suspended between it and another arm in the train that would hook the mail bag and bring it into the car. And that was done probably at 50 miles an hour when the train would go through. But that was my biggest uh, pastime, was spending time at that station. And of all the things that uh, we did and some of the things we shouldn't have done, uh, we survived it all and uh, it was a lot of fun. But uh, I, uh, these boys were all farmers I was uh, the oil man's son, but my father was a farmer years ago, and uh, we always had pigs and chickens, and later on we had a couple cows. Uh, the younger cow was sort of a pet of mine, and uh, I used to ride her around. I was small enough so I'd get on her back, and she'd let me ride her, and we'd go all over in the pasture which was a lot of fun, and <laughs> I never got any trouble with that. Her horns were just right, so if I let them lean forward, I could hang on to them. Um, when uh, the school we were in was a very large building, and it was a very interesting building, and it was, uh, well, something that will remain with all of us in memory all our lives because they, we won't see another building like that uh, for a school, I don't believe, uh, in any time in the future. But uh, it, was, it was a very interesting time. Another thing that we didn't have, you guys are all uh, interested in video games and you watch TV and you've got computers, we had nothing like that. We had uh, come home from school, do our homework, and if we didn't have work to do, we listened to the radio. There were programs on uh, the radio that uh, were like the Lone Ranger, Jack Armstrong, Terry and the Pirates. We'd listen to those, and of course, we had been to the movies a little bit, so we had visions of what things might be like, and uh, you would sit there and listen to the program and you could see what was going on in your imagination, which was uh, almost as good as the TV is today. In fact, sometimes I think it was better. Um, There's a hand that went over right there. Bob. Where about? Oh. Actually, radio sounds like TV. What? Yeah, but you didn't have anything like a TV. But radio basically Well. I, I, I'm not that good at hearing. <laughs> he just said he just said that a radio is a lot like a TV, but he, he said that. Yeah, it, it's a lot like a TV, but you don't you don't have any visual contact with it. You have just the uh, the audio. The, the, you can hear what's going on, and from hearing what they're doing, your mind, your your brain has a picture <coughs> of that. I think that's one of the big problems today is that you know everything you see everything you're in a very visual world and you guys don't have to use your imagination as much unless you read remember when i played the uh <coughs> the uh, record in a halloween time sorry long number remember how you had to use your imagination just by listening that was an old radio program uh that was told during that time and then your imagination has to work. And most of you said, "Well, oh, that was really cool. You know, do you have any more of those? 
Yes, yeah, stand up. Big voice, please. Can we ever get in trouble, Paul? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take the fifth on that one. <laughs> we, well, we all, we all got in trouble at one time or another for one thing or another, but uh, real our, the discipline back in those days was a lot uh, more pronounced than it is today. We could get in a lot more trouble for, and have a lot more consequences than we do, we do today. Like what? what? What would happen to you if you got in trouble in school? Well, you might get hit in the back of the head with your spelling book and <laughs> something like that. Yeah, the ruler crossing. Yeah. Yeah. Ruler well, crossing. A teacher could physically discipline you. Not that they would beat you up, but it, a teacher could physically you know, put you up, grab you by the shoulders and put you up against the wall, and he had your attention. Sometimes she. And the father <laughs> or the mother wasn't called, and there wasn't any question on that. Not that anybody ever got abused, but you knew if you got out of line, you knew what the consequences were. But I have to say, I don't think any of us were ever... It was some, minor. Some, of, some of our friends were. My friends. <laughs> <laughs> we were very good. <laughs> Let's try another kid. <laughs> another question. <laughs> well, this this guy in the back in the white shirt, the light color shirt. Yeah. You, you had your hand up one time. Um, what, but even if you went to the movies, we had to see it in black and white and stuff. So you would you yep. would get color. You would have to like imagine what they were really. Oh, uh, a lot of the movies back then were black and white. Yeah. Um, they were. <coughs> they, they were color. <laughs> they were Technicolor movies. Uh, but the black and white ones, if your imagination was good, you could see the color that was supposed to be there because uh, I can remember, that brings back a memory that uh, I talked to my mother about a movie after we'd seen it and she said it was in black and white and I would have sworn that it was in color and uh, I guess she checked on it and it was black and white. But uh, your imagination can do a lot of things for you. Uh, well, let's see. This fellow right here. Yep. Stand up. 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 The children were taken up by elevator. In the center of the building, there was a main elevator that went from the basement right up through to the, uh, at least the fifth floor. And we would all file on down at lunchtime. There'd be, well, a janitor, as we called them then, to run this elevator. He'd maybe put two classes. He'd take, they'd take us up to, to the floor and then we'd file around to the elementary lunchroom and the same thing when we came down. In the elementary lunchroom, the stairways were only used as an emergency exit to get down. But in the junior high and high school, we had to walk up to the fifth floor. And there was these huge white porcelain tables in there. We all brought our own lunches too. There wasn't any cafeteria going at that time. We brought our own dinners, and you would sit with your own class in the lunchroom. It wasn't mixed. You know, the sixth graders stayed together and whatever. The red-headed gentleman. Uh, what was it like the, the first color when we came out? Well, what was it like the first color? Just like this. Today, really, the only thing we enjoyed it a lot more. Uh, the first ones, well, we had what? Strange Theater and uh, yeah, Chain Theater. Chain Lane Theater. Uh, we did end up with one in Chay Z when we were in high school. There was a theater in Chay Z. <laughs> but whereabouts was it? Where the post office and Main Street Market are today. Uh, it was a garage and they converted it to a movie theater. That took place after the war. They had one in Champlain. Grouse's Point, Morris, uh, most everyone, owned by Kennedy people. Uh, 
Sure, I just like this. Down at the lake, uh -huh. Yes. This place, family. How, how much did it cost you to go to the movies? 50 cents. 50 cents. It must make me older. I remember right. going for a quarter. Yeah, so. we went to the Champlain Theater. It was 25 cents. 25 cents. The Strand Theater was a pretty uh, elaborate theater. It would cost you 50 cents. Wow. Popcorn, we went to the Champlain Theater more often. Yeah. Popcorn was between 5 and 10 cents a buy. I hear now on the Plattsburgh Island, it's 8, 10 dollars a buy. <laughs> Sometimes you use old potato bags to put it in. <laughs> so. Jake. Oh, can you tell us a story about um, when you got in trouble? Because <laughs> he knows you got in trouble. Yeah. And you aren't getting out of this, see? How much money have you got? <laughs> you got enough, I'll tell you. If not, we'll let Jake tell the story. How's that? Well, I'll tell you what discipline was. Uh, and it, it was nothing wrong with it. We were uh, juniors. High school, and there were certain things you weren't supposed to do. And anyway, I did one of the things that I wasn't supposed to do. Well, to make a long story short, uh, finally caught up with them. It was nothing terrible bad, but uh, anyway, so I was suspended from school for two weeks. My parents had to go see the principal before I could go back, and it was. Uh, and this was probably one of the more lax principles that we had through the years, because the one previous to this gentleman, well, I probably never would have finished school if she'd had to have him doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, I'll get you for that. <laughs> were there two pools for the boys and girls in the school? There were the pools that were here, but they had been closed. Uh, they weren't usable while we were in school. Really? I didn't know. Yeah. yeah, there were two pools. I remember the two pools, but I didn't realize they were closed Not for a while. Our time. They opened, uh, oh, probably, oh, 50, 50, 50, 70, probably the 70s or something they opened. They did, okay. they did reopen them yeah. for a while. They they yeah. yeah, they are. Not why we were there. Mr. Trumpley. Where are two pools located? Where? Yeah. They were on the second floor. Okay, if you can visualize that, you got to use your imagination. Say so they had these long hallways running east and west of the building. Like they ran parallel with Route 9. Okay, the, the auditorium was at a right angle to that. If you can visualize, you know, running with Route 9. Well, the office long hallways on the first floor, way down were basement areas, which I don't think we were ever allowed to go in. Down the basement, the hallways went, and we never went there. You come up on the main floor, which was a grand entrance. Uh, I'll get to where the pools were, but you come in this entrance, and there were marble stairs going up to the main floor, marble walls, beautiful plastered ceilings. We were not allowed to use that main entrance. I believe it was at class day when we were seniors. Class day, and so we graduated. Yeah. That's the only time students could come in that main entrance. It was after our class day in our senior year. But anyway, as you would come in there, there was another long alleyway, hallway that went back to where this main elevator went. Now that was the second floor. I'll go back down to the first floor. There were two homemaking rooms down in the first floor. See, there was two, almost two of everything that was separated by this long hallway that went back to where the elevator is. You get up onto the third floor, that's where the auditorium was. You would, and it faced the same direction as this is. You'd come in those huge leather covered doors that I spoke about with all the brass buttons on and where that auditorium was the gym there were two gymnasiums a girls gym and a boys gym there were huge doors that opened into the gymnasium on each side 
like for graduation or even class day or if there was a special program where more people were going to attend than what the main auditorium could hold, these huge doors would open into the gyms on each side where they could probably seat another 150 people in each one. Now, the pools were on the second floor right below that. You had, you had the, down, down the first floor you had the two homemaking rooms, the second floor you had the two pools, the third floor you had the two gymnasiums on each side of the auditorium. Then on the fourth floor, I know just, oh okay, the, the fourth floor actually was the upper part of the auditorium and the upper part of the gymnasiums. They were higher rooms than normal. Above that were the two cafeterias. Jordan? Um, did any of your radios have batteries? Yeah. 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 First radio we had was 1940, around 1940, during the war. Uh, before the, the war was just beginning, World War II. And uh, that was a big thing then because everybody listened to the radio. Something funny we did while we listened to the radio too is we would all sit and look at the radio. Look at the radio because hoping everybody there was a sat in a circle. And I guess we were hoping there was a picture, yeah. <laughs> you know, certain programs, you know, you didn't want to run the battery down to one of you was, but we were hoping how the war was going, how it was taking place, and then we had our programs that we listened to in the afternoon after four o'clock, five o'clock. Sky King was my favorite. Yeah, Sky King. Woman Abner was on and uh, I spoke in the cold. Okay. None of us TV. had TVs. Huh? No. We never had TVs. We didn't have TVs, so it uh, was after 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 first after television we had was uh, an eight inch picture of a football TV. That's when it first came out in this area. But the very first television they ever made was had a four inch picture to four inch picture in it and it had a long neck on it. Are you, are you familiar with one? It had a yes. long neck that came out yeah. of it, like a radio or a television piece. It had a long neck coming out of it. There was a four inch picture on it. That's what you have to watch. That was the first one they came out with. But there was very few of them up in this area. And there was one program on television when they first started. It was Grandma Poof. Poof. The Poof family. Poof family. Poof family. <laughs> and that was in French. And everybody listened to French and nobody, a lot of us didn't understand French, but it was funny to us anyway. It was better looking at the radio. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, Multicolored chair. Uh, um, you guys well, I can remember having to go to the principal's office Because somebody got them. <laughs> We, we, we did. Arguments, that's all. You know, they were friendly arguments. What? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like I was going to say, we did have, though, uh, when we were in high school, we had a, uh, I think he was our industrial arts or shop teacher, as we call him, a gentleman by the name of Finnegan. He was an ex paratrooper from World War II. And he would, we, we would box. Just literally, we'd go up on the fifth floor, one of the rooms. <laughs> And he'd pair a couple of us off, and, and we boxed during, well, it seems as though it was after our lunch hour. Oh, Wingate uh, was our Wingate. principal. And is he the one? But he was the one, he was referee. <laughs> 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 as far as getting into fights, no, we, we didn't. We took it out on well, one of the, One of the things that they've often asked in class during uh, studying different times was, boy, it would really be neat to live during that period of time. And then we discussed, you know, what it was, you know, what was good about it and what was bad about it. What would, what do you think is the best things about the time that you grew up and what would, what would you change? What would, what didn't you like about it that's better today? I think the best, uh, something I never forgot, was just before the war they had maneuvers, army maneuvers. And that took place in Blasburg. They had a base in Blasburg. And they, Covered mostly all the 22, Route 22, and it flew down. And it probably went up as far as north, I can't remember how far, but they had all their armored vehicles. 
There was all kinds of jeeps, big trucks, a lot of uh, guns, uh, motorcycles, tanks, and army people all over the place. And they were on maneuvers for about a week, and they were just all on the road, out in the fields, they just kind of took over. And these people went on, uh, they had to go on 24-hour duty with them, nothing to eat. They couldn't have, they didn't have anything with them. They didn't have water, they didn't have, this was training troops. Uh, that was a, quite an experience, because uh, I was just a little fellow. But I remember my people taking us, we had a car, and we went from all of these routes around. We got souvenirs from them, and uh, that was a real good experience. You know, to answer Mr. Lund's question a little more, all of us when we were children had a lot of chores to do. And even our, our summer vacations was mainly work all summer long. Right. Either helping your mother in the garden or your father in the fields. When I was 10 years old, I was driving a team of horses uh, almost constantly. We fed the pigs, we, we gathered the eggs, we fed the chickens, we did all these different things. But we didn't mind because everyone else was doing the same thing. It was just our way of life back then. We didn't feel, feel abused or picked on. And I really think we had a better time than you kids have today because we were around all the animals and nature and so forth. And I think people around our family more too. We were with our mothers and fathers on the right. constantly because we all worked together. I think people 50 years ago used to visit back and forth among friends and family a lot more than they do now because tonight, I mean, people come home from work, uh, kind of become a couch potato. You sit with your with your own family and you stay at home. You don't visit like they did like 50 years ago. Uh, you know, they go play cards at one, one another's home. Uh, Saturday summer, summers. Yep. That's everybody would meet, go to different, my grandparents, or, and everybody would come. Uh, there was more visiting back then than there is today. Yep. Uh, they had a, a big game, they played uh, 500. I remember that game it was a popular game. My neighbor. And it was complicated, you know, but then all the neighbors would come in. You might not have just the family, the neighbors would come in. You'd have probably a couple, three tables set up. And then they change around. And I don't know. We did that with our grandparents. It was mostly like going to the grandparents' home. Uh, this young lady here's had her hand up. How many hours a day was your school? Uh, Seven days a week. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. Oh, about the same year now. I say. Three thirty. Same as it is now. Same as it is now. When I started school, we got there at eight in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon. The country school. How many periods do you have a day now? Eight. Eight. No, we had eight. They're the two bus rides. Right? Can, can I just interrupt you for just a second? M Mr. Blair's got a little surprise for you. He brought, he, uh, maybe you'll uh, recognize some of this stuff that he dug up here. There you go. I've got one of those. Yep. <laughs> you steal it? <laughs> really? Remember no I, kidding. I, I first a, mentioned at the end of the hall, there were bells. This was one of them. On each floor, there yeah. were these bells at the end of There were three of them on each hall. They, uh, yeah, that was from the yeah. yeah, Bob, you got the hand. Well, I got one of the hands. I couldn't get the pair, no. but I got the minute hand. Right. Now, every day, I have um, when they had the uh, cafeteria, all been cleaned up, cleaned this up. I over in the residence where I live. I found this in baskets. You can take a look at the silverware and see the insignia that's on the silverware. It shows up. Uh, you used to also have. Uh, Cafeteria, the cooking equipment 
was still there when we went to school, but they never used it. Great big kettle. My mother and father, they went to school here. Um, the first, yeah. My father lived over here, on, uh, but yeah, the church. Uh, this young man school. down here, he's. Yes. Yes, yes, we did. And we had to take music right from first grade right up to our senior year. It wasn't a choice when we got to high school. I didn't have to sing next to him, but he never was on the <laughs> <laughs> But yes, we, we did have art in every class. I think when we got into high school, art was, I don't believe it's being mandatory, but music was. We also had to come into the auditorium and had a very large pipe organ in the auditorium. And it played these organ rolls, these, like a player piano plays. And we'd have assemblies where we'd have to sit here and listen to the pipe organ play classical music. That was sitting right here in the front. Yeah. It wasn't one of our most exciting times. We didn't much care for it. But we had to listen to the music. It, it didn't hurt any of us, though. No, we learned to appreciate it after a while. We didn't have band. We didn't have band. Previously, in the what we call the old school, back in 1924, in the 30s, they had a full orchestra. The, 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 the violins and the Jellos, Jellos and the whole thing. But when we were going to school, there all we had was music. There wasn't any band or orchestra. And, or, and we didn't have any pools. It seemed so after we got out, the pools opened and they had band and whatever. The small here at the Brown Church had his hand up for everyone. You, you asked that before. No, we didn't. We never got in trouble. No. A, a what? Mischief? No, mischief? no, we never had any mischief either. No. This fellow right here. Okay. Um, did you have like the same job if you were the only child? Like if you were an only child in family, would you have the same exact jobs as the other one? As like five in the family? Oh, no, no. See, I can speak for that. I was the oldest son, and it seems so as children came along after me, they had less and less to do. So I always had more to do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it stopped being the oldest son. It was. And then you got animals to take care of. We didn't get a chance to go off. Okay, how about somebody in the back row here? Okay, that gentleman. Stand up, please. Well, now you're talking to a good group for sports. Oh, uh, really? We never had time for too much sports. We uh, were up 4 30 in the morning. I was. Most of these fellows were up early. And we didn't get out of the barn until doing chores about 7 o'clock. We had to clean up, have breakfast, get on the bus, and get back at 3.30 in the afternoon. We got ready for chores again, and we back out to the barn, and we were out there at 6, 6.30. And then we ate dinner, and there wasn't too much time for sports. There wasn't a lot of sports going on in They had basketball. Yeah, there only yeah. one uh, Bill Gray in our class out of what? Ten boys, right. only one gentleman, and he wasn't a farmer. That's right. But, uh, <laughs> but we'd have pickup, ball game. Yeah. But we did go to dances on Saturday night. We had swear dances about every Saturday night. Yeah. Here at school? Church hall. Church, Church hall. hall. Church hall. No, this couldn't be used for dances. No. And uh, just about everybody around participated in square dance. That was the only We didn't have round dance. It was square dance. This fellow here was. Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Uh, very well decorated. Uh, chairs, different desks than what we have now. They were just a, a one-armed uh, desk with a platform on the side. That you, there's pictures over here. In one of these books. We'll pass it around. Mr. Blair, you said you had some of those. Do you have those old desks? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have one? I got one. The same fireplace mantle that's in the senior room now was in the Shakespeare room. Stained glass windows and the entrance doors. I came from England. Hard came from England, did it? 
It's uh, it was a mahogany. Well, they, they, they panel, 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 panel finish in it. Really luxurious. It was a pleasure being in there. The the blackboard to they could cover the blackboard in the Shakespeare room. Remember, right. there was a huge panel drop that if they wanted to not see the blackboard for some reason, this huge panel drop would come down. They would just rise right up into the wall. Just give a better effect in the room. Had the fireplace in it. Oh yeah, beautiful. What's this young lady right here? <laughs> I never learned one card from another. No, I ain't aware. I'm not a card player. No, I'm not you. No. <laughs> See, he he was sick a lot, so he had time to play. Do you play poker, Kayla? Pretty solitary. Did you have music for a special? Music? Yeah. Special? Yeah. No, we had music class. Um, we were, they tried to teach us a little bit about reading music, but. Basically, it was singing, and we always, there were concerts similar to what there are now. But, you know, coming to the music concerts now and, say, like the senior choir, you might have one boy, two boys in it. Ours, you had to take music, so there were probably, like to say, the senior choir, which was the juniors and seniors, you maybe had 30, about 15, 20 boys, 15, 20 gals, you had to take music. One of, the one of the questions I have, I noticed in that news article that I brought up there that a lot of people that went to the old school were upset when they tore that down and replaced it with this school. Do you feel it was the right thing to do? Uh, if, if so, why or why not? Well, I can remember, uh, well, we were all living here at that time. Maybe Lauren was stationed, he was in the service, but... Uh, There was a lot of discussion about tearing the old school down. Now, if you really think about it, the old school, as we call it, was only about 50 years old when it was torn down. Now, this building here is pushing 30 or more. And they've already spent numbers of millions of dollars just to keep this building, keep the rain out of it, keep it intact. And what they call the old school was, uh, was approximately 50 years old. The man that tore it down went bankrupt. The what, what happened? The man that tore it down actually went bankrupt. It was they such trying a Trying to tear it down? Trying, trying to tear it down. down. Exactly. No so kidding. Just, yeah. Took so much time and he just, effort. Because uh, it, it was so well constructed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The piping inside this uh, was all brass plate. Uh, they... Uh, the electrical system was out of this world, you know. Uh, it was really well engineered. Anything that Miner, Mr. Miner built was the best. You know, it was all in conduit. If you're not familiar with conduit, the wire was run through pipe. And that's a whole today you have to do this. And back then you didn't have to do it, but that was running then. Uh, it wasn't conduit with the X wire, which was a cable covered wire. Uh, the plumbing was all extra heavy plumbing. Uh, the material, it was all reinforced with reinforcement iron when they built this thing. My wife's grandfather, I wish I had the picture, I don't know where it's at, but for When they were building this, they had donkey carts. Call them. They were motorized donkey carts. And they had staging. That was all poured. The walls are all poured around it. And uh, they motor up. They went from one side to the other. They stage and run back and forth. They go around these curves, these donkey carts, full of cement. It was a constant. They'd go up one side and down the other. And they just kept dumping them. That went on for right, day after day after day. And there was plumbers and there put this the plumbing in. I guess your father worked on it, your grandfather worked on it. My you? grandfather, which is Jake's great great grandfather, was the head carpenter on the old school. His name is on the plaque which will come in the right. entrance. Um, you, you mentioned when the school was torn down and the feeling. 
if I remember right, and I think I'm pretty close here. At that time, the facility was subsidized quite great by the Miner Foundation. And to renovate the old school, again, that was less than 50 years old, they come out with some sort of a figure of, I don't know, a million, a couple million dollars or whatever. And the state and the federal would not give any money towards the renovation of this old school. The Miner Foundation would not give any money towards the renovation of the old school. But the state, whatever the funding was, I don't know, 50%, 75%, between the state and the federal, and the Miner Foundation at that point said they would give a million dollars towards the construction of a new school, but wouldn't give anything to the renovation of the old school. So with the Miner's contribution and the state and the federal, the local share of the bonding, I believe, for the new school was only around $800,000. And that was probably the turning point on demolishing the old school. It boiled down basically to the financial commitment to a small community, plus there seemed to be people at that time that were dead set on removing the old the physical structure just to get rid of it. And at that same period now, maybe your grandparents and some of your parents can remember, up at the Miner Farm, there were beautiful buildings up there and beautiful houses that were burned to the ground by the same group of people. Administrators of the Miner Foundation. Yeah. If, we, if that was here today, Shelburne Museum and the Shelburne Farm wouldn't hold a candle to what okay, Shazy I could provide. If I got building I have pictures of calendars of, uh, yeah. of the farm. I want to probably have seen them in this. Oh, okay. Also, uh, as Mr. Baker mentioned, this building right across the street known as Gray Gables, the one where all the pigeons fly in and out of, at one time that was residence for most of the well, the single and the bachelor teachers lived over there. They, their meals and their laundry were all provided by the WH Miner. And this goes up into, oh God, into the 50s or whatever. But the teachers lived over at Gray Gables and there are some apartments on one side of it where the married teachers lived. But that was all run by the same, same people. And the, the heat was all supplied from the school, yeah. along with the, the, the manse over here, the Presbyterian manse, uh, museum, the museum. It was all supplied from the sidewalks that the teachers <coughs> came up on and the students. The heat ran underneath the sidewalks, and there were heated sidewalks and uh, radiant heat, so they never had snow on them. They never had to trouble. But it, but it is a rumor that they did not go underground from Gray Gables to no, the school. No, they did not. No, yeah, a lot of people like think the there was a pipe chase yeah. where the mechanicals went back and forth. But no, mm -hmm. they did not like walk the under. People would know. My father-in-law used to think that he was uh, maintenance around here for a couple of years, and he used to, his job was to go down and pack all the valves and everything in that tunnel. So they start here at the boiler room and go all the way over to the. Yeah. And they have to go to the Presbyterian Church, the museum. Yeah, they, they had huge coal-fired boilers in the old right. school. And there used to be, in back of the school, it was sort of like a reserve, this huge pile of coal. You know, just, they bring coal in almost every day, but they always had this huge reserve piled out. I got one question. When this picture was passed around, who would wear a jacket like that today? Jake Beeman, you wouldn't be seen dead in a jacket like that. <laughs> it's got to be one of those Adidas or whatever it says on it. But you're looking at this, we all got these uh, plaid coats on. Mr. Baker's got one that's too small for him, but that's all right. Yeah, I, one thing I want to point out is that one of the things we've talked a lot in class, but, you know, no, no matter what we've been studying, we talked about food, shelter, clothing, transportation, energy, recreation, 
stuff like that. And you'll notice that, that these gentlemen have touched at some point, probably without realizing it, on all of those things. You know, how people lived because of their environment, what it was like, and, and during different periods of time. And, you know, all of them, are, you know, I hope you notice some of that that has been mentioned. Uh, you're talking about clothing. A lot of our clothes, when I lived on a, in a rural district, went to country school, my mother made clothes. We, I had uh, three brothers, and all our clothes were made, even to our jackets. You know, they were passed down from my grandparents a lot. And my mother always sold and made her own. I guess even down to our pants if we had to. You know. If you got a hole in it, you threw it away, right? <laughs> you know, a lot of patches with a patch yeah. over a patch. And, you know, that was what we wore around the farm. And but they were always clean. They were yeah. always clean. They were clean. My mother washed my hand. I, I remember time. my mother on a scrub board. Right. Oh, yeah. You see then, these things hanging on the wall now. You wonder what they're for. And the first when we got, they came out with a gasoline washing machine. Run by a uh, little brakes and strap engine. And, uh, You'd have to kick it by hand. You'd run it in the house now, but you would exhaust it through the wall. And that thing was just, it would vibrate all over the floor like this, but that did the washing. Wow. Uh, had a, <laughs> but you had to fill that washer. You had to hand. fill it by hand now. That You heat your water you by drain, hand. You drain it by hand. And you drained it out by hand. A drain on the bottom. And what we had, we had a drain to go, a sink. We had a, a pump in the house. Call a cistern pump. And we could use a cistern pump. Uh, we pumped that up and had a dry, what we call a wet sink. And that went out into a dry well outside. But that was our only running water. And my mother would draw water off of that and heat it. That's how we took our bath. It's quite an experience. Do you know what a cistern is? Yeah. Some of them better know. We, some of them actually, who did a report on it? Okay. We did. Christina did. Or, yeah. And uh, we just saw one up at Upper Canada Village. Remember in the Lauks Farm home, we had the bright or the wet sink inside, and that, they had the hand pump, and that came from a, a cistern in the basement. Mr. Kilman had a cistern in his house. That's where Mr. Ledoux lived. That's right. That's where George lives. There is a cistern there. Uh, there was there, but it's been taken out since. And the old-fashioned pipe that came down from the eaves, uh, they were all hand bored. That's where it was filled from. And the overflow was the same way going out. If it got too full, it would overflow and go run out. But those that's tore out, but my son left that in the wall because. So it's kind of well, where you used to live, Mr. Kuhlman lives, and a cistern is still that there. That cistern is still there. That's still there. Right. Yeah, that's right. And that was, when I went there, that was a coal furnace in there. My people put the hot water heating system in. But that was a coal furnace. And my mother is the one that tended the coal furnaces. She's the one that made sure the fires were made in the morning because we were out in the barn and at night. And you'd have to burn off the gases on this coal stove because if you didn't, you'd have to leave the door open, build up gas, and you could have an explosion. You know, it, it was dangerous. But no one is something you watched, and that was a. That's right. Are any of you familiar with how Class Day started, or the history behind Class Day? Doesn't that way ever since the school started? Yeah. My mother graduated in 1933, and uh, they had Class Day. Almost the very same class day we had in 1954. That's, that's what I was told. It started on Wednesday. Isn't this the only school that has that? That's the only school that's ever had anything like this. It was the only school that had that. I heard very good reports on this year's class day. It was excellent. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, was it was very it was compared, it was heartwarming to hear it. Compared to what you've been had previously. And uh, it's getting back to what it, it, it was used to be the thing. thing. It was more important than graduation. The only yeah. thing they've got to do is improve yeah. Yeah. their speaker system. Yeah. People had a problem hearing what was going on. If you were sitting way in the back, okay. 
We're doing that right now. We've got a time capsule that we're doing that they have to predict what's going to happen to them after they graduate. So we've got that on, and, and they'll open that when they're seniors. So. Right. Right. That's cute. Why don't we take a couple of questions here? And who else? Okay. Both of you. <laughs> Go ahead, David. What if you didn't have a radio in your house? What would you do besides that if you didn't have a radio? Well, I, I think we all had radios. That was that, that was a big part of our entertainment in the evening. And one thing about the radio now, we go back to, okay, World War II. We all, that was the big war. I think it was between 5 and 6 in the evening. It was news. And when the news came on, during the war, this is from the 40s up through 45 or a little later, there was complete silence at our dinner table when the news came on because that was the only, uh, that was the only news that people would receive. It's not like constant TV today where you can turn on one station somewhere and find out what's going on in the world, but that was it. And, they would tell all the camp campaigns that the soldiers were doing, but I can still hear my grandfather when that news would come on. He had to hear it. It was a little hard to hear and everything. Anybody made any noise, he'd go, shush. <laughs> shush. <laughs> I, I remember too as a kid where they where you'd go to the movie theater, sat Saturday matinee, and they would have newsreels there at the movie theater right. because not everybody had TV. Right. And and you would see clips. They also had serials, which you would see like a, a an ongoing kind of uh, story. It might be Captain Marvel or Superman or something like that. And then to get you to come back, they would show you just a portion of it, and they would cut it off. But I, and then they'd come back the following week to see the next sec segment of it. And you were talking about radio, what we did before. We didn't have a radio. Well, I can't remember when we didn't have a radio. And that night, they'd have apples. Make popcorn. We had a wood stove, and you sat around. My father would probably tell us stories or something like that, and that's where we said our prayers at night. Something else we used to do at night: we used to raise beans, beans, beans little that's white right. beans, right. and we'd raise four or five acres of them. And in the winter time, we'd sit around the kitchen table with a big lamp, and we'd have to sort those beans and take all the bad ones out. You'd right. sort beans for hours. Okay. And finally, you'd get a bag full, and Dad would take that with my grandpa, the Blacksburg, and he'd sell it to our store. Had a market for them. But it took a long time to sort those out. Oh, they could during the war. Uh, you, you never heard buy that. Butter. <laughs> there was no butter on the market. You couldn't go into a store and buy butter. And my father worked out. He worked for the, uh, for Georgia Pacific, his now because they were short of help. My father had a heart condition, and anybody could get a job. So my father went down for work, and they'd ration out tires and things, but I'm kind of getting ahead of my story. But he also raised what they called, he had probably seven head of cattle, and he raised veal, uh, and made butter. They, they had a separator, and he cranked it by hand. You know, it would separate the milk and the cream. And the cream would go into one bucket, and the milk would go in the other, which was skim milk. And that milk was, uh, the cream was churned, and we'd make butter with it. And I 
at that time, Don Orr, like, we were getting a dollar a pound and we couldn't make enough of them. Uh, that was, that people was, would come from all over. We did that. that was one of my jobs, to take the milk right. from the barn to the house, to be, and to separate. separate it, and then I take the skim milk back and when feed the say, cats. When you separate it, this is hard work. This thing didn't turn by itself. You, know, you really had to put a lot of momentum to it. It'd come on with both hands. Once you got it white, the faster you got it going, it's, a lot of times you had to make sure everything was snug in it. It was all done with disc, they were stacked, it looked like funnels stacked on top of each other. And it would spin inside of this thing. That wasn't Downs type, man. I got a brother in law, but I don't know if anybody knows Glenn Lattimore or not. You look at Glenn and he got a big snare with the top of his eye. And that's how that happened. No boys came out of there. And they were razor sharp. He got a nasty gash one, but he was a separator too. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, we did that. Yeah. We made a lot of butter. We made a lot of butter. It took me so uh, it was the skin milk went to the baby beef, uh, and they had uh, what was it they called the milk from the butter? Buttermilk. Buttermilk. Butter 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 for cooking. Buttermilk for cooking. Butter cooking. People come all over for that. Uh, Make pancakes for that. They had, they, did, they had small chunks of butter in it. This, but this is delicious butter. You can't buy it for much that day. It had, uh, took two quarts of cream to make a pound of butter. And we try to keep all red cattle, uh, Jersey or Guernsey, because they had a high uh, butter fat. And you could, when you milk them, if you set that off overnight, take a quart of milk, you'd probably have three quarters of the cream and the rest would be just milk in it. And that's, but they didn't give a lot of milk, but it was more cream and it was very rich. Did you ever see the milk bottle when, when the cream comes to the top of it? Yeah. Yeah, that's before they that's homogenize it. So we never knew what homogenized milk was yeah. until our fashions in the 50s or 60s. We all brought up on raw milk, you can tell. <laughs> milk, when you milk cans, which were tin cans, probably some of your people have them. And uh, they would take and we had to put them with ice. And then the summer, in the wintertime, they go out on the lake or a big pond and cut ice. And they uh, skid all this ice up into this, what they call an ice house. It was all framed in and you insulated with sawdust. The tops were open, you pour sawdust in, in between and over the top of it. And as you needed your ice during the summer, now this would keep all summer long in the hot sun with the sawdust on it. And you go out there and you pull a cake of ice out you cut the section that you want, they were big, they were large cakes. You cut that up, you had a nice bag, you cut that up and then quarter it up. You throw this into a big cane, that's where you pulled your milk in. You had to set it down in there, uh, use cans, and so it wouldn't spoil. And the milkman would come around just about every day, uh, pick up the milk, year round. And he couldn't get through in the wintertime. He'd come with a horse. Uh, milk man we had, I always remember, followed by the name of Francis Fredette. He lived uh, on a back road, way down on a back. And that's how he made part of his living. It was a rough morning, but it was, he enjoyed it. I know Mrs. Amon's class has got to get to a special pretty soon. Why don't we just take about two more questions, okay. and um, and then we'll go on. Um, Joy? Um, what kind of trouble did you get into? We didn't get into trouble. <laughs> you already answered that one. Uh, Katrina, you had your hands up for a long time. Why don't you stand up so we can hear you? No, we really didn't dare to because, uh, remember I spoke about the truant officer? Yeah. Uh, if anybody did skip school, especially from junior high on up, this man went right to the house but to, I, see, to see if it was legitimate. And really, with the parents we had, you didn't skip school. But I do remember no once, question. this fellow here, myself, we went to Boston, we were in school and we went. Out. We got a pass to get out for some reason or another. We went to Blasburg and we met up with a truant officer. Put his hand right on that shoulder and walked up behind us. Right up behind us. <laughs> and he said, I'll see you in school tomorrow morning, boys. 
that you, you had to, uh, if you knew this gentleman, of course we were I don't know, teenagers or whatever, and this guy at that time had to be 60. Oh, you see, he seemed quite ancient. But he, like I say, he was six foot something tall and had arms on him, well, you know, reach from here over to there. And, and, like, and the cafeteria, just the way he'd stand, and there was, you didn't skip school other than these gentlemen here. Yes. Yeah. The we didn't really skip. We, we got a pass for something, but we were, we were supposed to have a reason for it. Well, you, you didn't we do didn't it. We didn't have the right reason. We were downstream. He was, he was downstream. We walked right up behind us and put hands on his shoulder. Boys, you will be a school tomorrow, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. No, you didn't do anything like that. No, it was unheard of. Sure enough, it was unheard of. Jordan. Just what you know, What was it, Jordan? Mr. B. Yeah. John, John B. Sarah. At school or at home? At home. Oh, what kind of games? What? We played kick the can. You ever play kick the can? That hide and seek or something. But kick the can was our game. Galen. Was it too minor a lot when the old school was down? No. No. You probably would have had a connection. Neither was Mrs. Minor. It wouldn't have been torn down had it been. Yeah. Riker. Oh, Correct. we did that when we skated. We that. That's where you keep spinning around. Is that what you call it? We did that when we skated. We yeah, like a scroll pond. Yeah, see, there used to be a front pond and a back pond. Oh, really? And, oh, yeah. Well, the front one was where it is now, and there was the back pond. We were not allowed on the front pond at any time of the year. We could go and skate and shovel off the back pond. How far back was that? Yeah, not in it either. Yeah, not in it either. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> where the ball field is now. Yeah. Right up to the corner of the driveway. Yeah, across the road. That's right. Down along that cedar edge. Uh huh. Uh, it was sort of a kidney shape. Yeah. We used to race bolts and bolts in there. Race bolts and bolts in there. Yeah. In yeah. In our later years. Yeah. I I uh, I remember uh, Mac McQuinney telling about how they used to take the canoes. Up by the bridge and right. play with Paul and knock people off the canoe with Paul. Yeah, we used to go watch them. My grandfather, yeah. people up there, they take a long pole with canoes and they put a bunch of rags or something on the end, like a buffer, and then uh, you know, they tip over in the, in the canoe. Oh, well, that was a really thing down there. Yeah. David. Um, did you ever walk the uh, goat? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I thought the John. Detention, yeah. Well, they didn't not really have detention. Suspension, but not. Aaron. Do they write with pencils or pens? That's a different question for you. Oh, we had inkwells. Inkwells. Do you have any girls with pigtails? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember my wife was one of them. <laughs> One, uh, you talk about the uh, eight wells and stuff, uh, punishment. When we were in second grade, we had this teacher, and you were caught chewing on your fingernails, your finger went in the ink well. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of blue. You're that, David? You have blue fingers. <laughs> Carl. To where? The dungeon in the schoolhouse? We had a dungeon in the schoolhouse? No, no. I don't think so. Not in our time. Jordan, and we're going to make that our last question, okay? Could you say it again, Jordan? I'm not sure if everybody heard you. Marcel. Model A, Model A, Model B. There were more Model A's than Model B's. And there was Christ, which is what's out. Mr. Kuhlman, by the way, still comes to school on a horse, just like 
Mr. Ledoux's teacher did. You know, he still rides his horse in the morning. Oh, it's the same horse. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for coming in and, and we really, uh, really appreciate it. Yeah, we got a book out, so there's a book out there someplace. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're a good group. Great class. Thank you very much.